I'm Adam. And I'm Pim. And this, and this is, is where there's a Williams, there's a way. Hey, Pim, who's the bravest person that you know? Reinhold Mesner, without a doubt. He was the first to make a solo ascent to Mount Everest. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. What? He's considered by many to be the greatest mountain climber ever. You can't blame a chimpanzee for being so interested in that. Usually people say Martin Luther King Jr. or the parents with a question like that. Nope. Reinhold Messner. Ben Folds 5 made a great album named after him too. In today's book, we learn about Clara, a young girl who took on a mantle of social justice. Let's get started. Brave Girl, Clara and the Shirtwaist Maker Strike of 1909 by Michelle Markle, pictures by Melissa Sweet. A steamship pulls into the harbor carrying hundreds of immigrants and a surprise for New York City. The surprise is dirt poor, just five feet tall, and hardly speaks a word of English. Her name is Clara Lemlick. This girl's got grit and she's going to prove it. Look out, New York. Clara knows in her bones what is right and what is wrong. What's wrong begins a few weeks after the Limelicks move into their tenement in America. No one will hire Clara's father. They will, however, hire Clara. That's right, Clara. Companies are hiring thousands of immigrant girls to make blouses, coats, nightgowns, and other women's clothing. They earn only a few dollars a month, but it helps pay for food and rent. So instead of carrying books to school, many girls carry sewing machines to work. Clara becomes a garment worker. From dawn to dusk, she's locked up in a factory. Rows and rows of young women bend over their tables, stitching collars, sleeves, and cuffs as fast as they can. Hurry up, hurry up, the bosses yell. Rat-a-tat-tat-tat, hisses Clara's machine. The sunless room is stuffy from all the bodies crammed inside. There are two filthy toilets, one sink, and three towels for 300 girls to share. Clara learns the rules. If you're a few minutes late, you lose half a day's pay. If you prick your finger and bleed on the cloth, you're fined. If it happens a second time, you're fired. The doors are locked and you're inspected every night before you leave to be sure you haven't stolen anything from the factory. But Clara is uncrushable. She wants to read. She wants to learn. At the end of her shift, though her eyes hurt from straining in the gaslight and her back hurts from hunching over the sewing machine, she walks to the library. Can you imagine going to the library after working all day? I do that all the time. I've always loved going to the library. Although there was a period of time when I was scared to go because I lost a book and I was afraid of how much it would cost. I was just a little kid at the time, though. I'm sure it only cost a few dollars. Also, I'm willing to bet that your working conditions in the school are much different than working in a factory where you're locked inside and you have to share a bathroom with hundreds of others. Yes, I do have a much better work life. And I go to the library for books like this, not so that I can learn English. Clara's living up to her title as a brave girl so far. She fills her empty stomach with a single glass of milk and goes to school at night. When she gets home in the late evening, she sleeps only a few hours before rising again. As the weeks grind by, Clara makes friends with the other factory girls. At lunch, they share stories and secrets as if they were in school, where they belong. Clara smolders with anger, not just for herself, but for all the factory girls working like slaves. This was not the America she'd imagined. The men at the factory tell her they've been trying to get the workers to team up in a union. Then they'd strike, refuse to work until the bosses treat them better. But the men don't think the ladies are tough enough. Not tough enough? Because they're girls? Oh yes they are! Clara knows it. She'll show them. From then on, at the sewing tables and on the street corners, Clara urges the girls to fight for their rights. When the seamstresses are overworked, she says strike. When they're underpaid, she says strike. When they're punished for speaking up, she cries strike. And the girls do. Each time Clara leads a walkout, the bosses fire her. Each time she pickets, her life is in danger. The bosses hire men to beat her and other strikers. 
the police arrest her 17 times. They break six of her ribs, but they can't break her spirit. It's shatterproof. Clara hides her bruises from her parents. A few days later, she's on the picket line again. And the other girls think, if she can do it, we can do it too. For weeks, the small strikes go on, but the bosses find other young women to do the work for the same low pay and long hours. Arrested 17 times? Broken ribs? That is really showing commitment to a cause. Not only that, you have to remember she was only a kid. Imagine the feeling that you go through as a parent. This girl is doing everything that she can to help the working conditions for people all around her. But she's abused and incarcerated. They were probably proud of her but scared for her well-being at the same time. So basically you're saying that she was brave. Yep, I guess that's what I'm saying. We must do something bigger, think Clara and other union leaders. Something huge, a giant strike at every garment factory in the city. The union holds a meeting. Throngs of workers pack the seats, the aisles, the walls. The hall thrums with excitement. Clara listens to speech after speech. The speakers, mostly men, want everyone to be careful. Two hours pass. No one recommends a general strike. Finally, the most powerful union leader in the country goes up to the podium. Not even he proposes action, so Clara does. That's right, Clara. She calls out from the front of the hall. The crowd lifts her to the stage where she shouts in Yiddish, I have no further patience for talk. I move that we go on a general strike. And she starts the largest walkout of women workers in US history. The next morning, New York City is stunned by the sight of thousands of young women streaming from the factories. One newspaper calls it an army. Others call it a revolt. It's a revolt of girls, for some are only 12 years old. And the rest are barely out of their teens. In the coming weeks, Clara is called a hero. She lights up a chilly union halls with her fiery pep talk. Her singing lifts the spirits of the picketers. When a group of thugs approaches, she yells, Stand fast, girls! And they do. All winter long, in the bitter cold, in their cheap, thin coats, tired and starving and scared. The girls walk alongside the men on the icy sidewalks of the picket line. They spill out of the union halls, blocking the roads, filling street corners and public squares. Newspapers write stories about them. College girls raise money for them. Rich women, swathed in fur coats, picket with the factory girls. By the time the strike is over, hundreds of bosses agree to let their staff form unions. They shorten the work week and raise salaries. The strike emboldens thousands of women to walk out of garment factories in Philadelphia and Chicago. And the strike convinces Clara to keep fighting for the rights of workers. Her throat is hoarse, her feet are sore, but she has helped thousands of people, proving that in America, wrongs can be righted, warriors can wear skirts and blouses, and the bravest hearts can beat in girls only five feet tall. Clara Limelick is a Labor Day hero. I feel like Labor Day is a celebration of the common person. There's so many people like Clara Limelick that stood up to the face of oppressive work situations, but they aren't recognized. That's probably because, unfortunately, it took a large number of workers to speak out, stand up, and strike for many companies to treat their employees like humans. Many of these people fought more than 100 years ago to change the institution. They fought for higher wages, for better working conditions, they fought so people like you and me didn't have to anymore. Hopefully. Wow, this was really a heavy topic. I agree. Let's take the day off. Let's do it. But before you take some time off, remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel. And happy Labor Day. I'm Adam. And I'm Pim. And this and is, this is where, there's where There's a Williams, Williams There's a Way. More about the garment industry. Between 1880 and 1920, two million Jews immigrated to America, fleeing persecution, pogroms, government sanction attacks, and poverty in Russia, Ukraine, Poland, and other parts of Eastern Europe. Many of these immigrants found work in the booming garment industry. In 1909, 
The year of the general strike, nearly 400 factories employed 40,000 people made blouses for half the country. Of these workers, 80% were female, 70% were between 16 and 25 years of age, and 65% were Russian, Eastern European Jewish. The remainder of the workers were Italian and American. Many of the factory owners were Eastern European Jews who had worked their way up in the business. Abuses were rampant throughout the industry. Many bosses shaved time off lunch hours, set clocks back at the end of the day to fool the workers, made them work long hours, including illegal evening work, for little money, forced them to pay for cloths soiled with blood or spilled food, and fired them at will. Some factories hired girls as young as six years old to cut threads from garments. At the beginning of the 1909 strike, police and judges sided with the affluent factory owners. 600 young women were arrested and 13 girls, one as young as 12 years old, were sentenced to five days in the workhouse. Police brutality ceased only when members of the Women's Trade Union League, made up of wealthy and middle-class women, joined the picketers and held meetings to publicize their plight. When the strike ended, 339 waste and dress manufacturing firms allowed workers to form unions, shorten their work week, and increase their hourly wages. Some companies refused to negotiate, notably the Triangle Waste Factory, where the following year hazardous conditions led to a fire that claimed 146 lives. The tragedy raised public awareness even further about the evils of the garment industry. Kara Limelick, then in her early 20s, investigated health and safety conditions in the garment district for the union. In the aftermath of the strike, thousands of workers in Philadelphia, as well as in Chicago, Cleveland, and Kalamazoo, st struck for better working conditions or campaigned for the right to organize unions. Along with Clara, fellow strikers Pauline Newman and Rose Schneiderman took on leadership roles in the labor movement. The progress made by the garment industry activists affected jobs throughout the country. Though there are still wrongs to be righted, today's workers have five-day work weeks, overtime pay, and other protections due in great part to labor leaders like Clara Limelick and the thousands of brave girls who picketed in the winter of 1909. Did you know President Grover Cleveland and lawmakers in Washington wanted a federal holiday to celebrate labor? Cleveland signed an act in 1894 establishing the federal holiday. Senator James Henderson Kyle of South Dakota introduced S-730 to make Labor Day a federal legal holiday on the first Monday of September.